I want everybody to meet John Walker and his wife Patty. And these are Bryce, Cun Bryce Cottingham's grandparents. And he is from Traveler's Rest. And when Bryce told me when we were talking about the Native Americans, he said, well, my grandfather has been finding things on his property in Traveler's Rest. And I have goosebumps talking about because I'm so excited to introduce him. He said about in the 1970s, so well before you guys were born, he started finding things on his property. He got so interested with it that he got in touch with the University of South Carolina and their South Carolina Institute of Archaeology and Anthropology has actually taken such an interest that they have come out and actually started digging up on his property. He's got so much cool stuff to share. Most of the things that they have found are what we call prehistoric relics. So like we think of the Cherokee Indians and we think about current Indian tribes. Most of the stuff that they've found on his property is well before even that. So think about land bridge theory, where they came across and started migrating to different areas, maybe as far back as that, okay? And with her, without further ado, I'm going to uh, let Mr. Walker go ahead and talk with us, and then at the end, he's got some possible question and answer time for you, okay? Great job. Thank you, and I appreciate the, the credit does go to the South Carolina Institute and some other people, particularly Tommy Charles with the Institute. Dr. Terry Ferguson with Wofford, Wesley Breedlove, a local historian, and the late Ann McEwen. All of those names are really important in our community to people who have these interests. We have a picture of a great big, I guess, a woolly mammoth or whatever, because what I want to be sure and, and get across is that the Indians go so much further back in time than we think about from what we're exposed to uh, in TV and so forth. To give you an example, if you say that the Indian occupation, if this is a timeline and the in Indian occupation extended all the way back to here, say something like 15, 16,000 years, and there are different theories on that, one of the oldest things that I can think of uh, in time would be the Egyptian pyramids would be right about here. But the Indians in North America extended back this far. The Indians that we know about since Europeans, starting with Columbus, began settling in the New World would be limited to this tiny little space right here. And in this part of the country, the bow and arrow was not developed by Indians until right about here. And that brings up an important thing, and we'll go to the next picture. We're, Indians, the animals were really important to the Indians and that's why we've got some of these things to share. And back at the time of that woolly mammoth, you had much larger animals. The um, uh, bears were huge, they had these saber-toothed cats, we used to call them saber-toothed tigers when I was a child. We played with little toys of the tigers. They weighed as much as 800 pounds. Beavers were the size of grizzly bears, they had these massive animals. So the, the Indians of North America were surrounded by these creatures, not dinosaurs, that was much before, but big mammals. These points uh, are not particularly impressive, but they're important because this is a class of point that's probably the most frequently found in Greenville County. Um, if you had come to this site before this school was built, before the school preceding this building was built, and it were a plowed field, you would almost certainly find some of these points if you walked across this field. You might have even found pottery. Uh, you might, if, if, if it were explored, there might have been pits that had charcoal in it where the Indians had been cooking. Um, axe heads, any number of things, but the occupation was so widespread it would almost be certain that on this site you would have found some of these points and they are generally classified as a Mara Mountain Point. We call it that. We don't have any idea what the Indians called themselves at that time because we have no written record. But they are in the neighborhood of four to 7,000 years old and they would have been right here. So you are, where you live around Greenville, where you go every day, you are driving, living, 
studying over Indian occupied land at one at one time. You can be assured of that. Um, the, when all this was graded off, some of the artifacts might have been found, but others are captured in the landscape soils and the areas on this campus even now. They're still there. Okay, go ahead. With this is a collection of points that Patty and I have found on our farm, and that represents a broad range of types of points and time periods. Uh, a few of these smaller points like this and this may be fairly recent. They may be as recent as say 1500 years ago. But they are nevertheless, most of these points are spear points. They're not arrowheads because keep in mind most of the Indian culture that in North America that precedes us, it, especially in this part of North America, uh, the Indians were making spear points to throw with a device called an atlatl. Flip to the next one there, would. Up until about 2,000 years ago, that's the way most of these points were being used. And that device, as simple as it looks, has been reproduced and the person throwing that can put a tremendous amount of energy into a spear like that. I've seen a demonstration where he took that and he was using river cane, he had reproduced it, and when he threw it, it went all the way across to the other side of all those cars. And that's what they would have been relying on to take down some of these big animals that we were talking about. Um, next slide. Um, what I wanted to mention is that these, when these Indians were, were, they call it napping out these points, a tremendous amount of, I think the word would be debitage or something like that, fragments fall off. For one point like this would generate a whole handful of little chips, flakes, slivers of rock. And if you look around in your garden at home or a place where you've been given permission to look for arrowheads or spear points, you'll, you'll find a lot of that material, sometimes it'll be kind of a clue that you're about to find a real good point, because for every point that you find in areas that are rich with that material, you'll find a lot of that. I almost visualize now if you're around a group of people um, sitting together, if you take a look around, usually everybody will be looking at their smartphones, doing this, this, this. Well, I can visualize the Indians sitting around the campfire and they all had rocks in their hands and they were chipping out the weapons that they were going to need the next day. And in those places where they did that, you find so much of that material laying there, rich with material. Um, okay, this, um, we talked about the Institute of Archaeology. Um, they became very interested in looking for sites in the upcountry that they could explore for uh, Indian occupation. And it's been difficult to find good sites because so much of our soil is erodible here that everything's kind of jumbled up and plowed up and, and they really can't learn very much from it. But they decided they would come up and, and do some exploration and we had access to a backhoe. And so we were, we were not using the backhoe to try to find Indian artifacts. We were just trying to find good places to look for Indian artifacts. Now these archaeologists are not interested in just trying to dig everything up so they can find a lot of cool stuff and put it in a museum. Um, the reason they get into so much detail in their search is that they're trying to find things that are undisturbed, that are, that are situated right and right in the place where it was put when that Indian was using it or when something happened to that Indian. And then they can associate it with the soil, with other things that are around it, and if they can find the right kind of material, a lot of times it's charcoal, it's black just like the charcoal on a charcoal grill, they can age that by a process that we usually call carbon dating. And so if they can <coughs> find everything and carefully extract it without damaging it as they get into it, they can really learn the age of the material, 
we were able, when they did the dig on our property, they were able to find plant material that the Indians were using for food. They identified all the different types of nuts and berries that were on the site that they used for food. They even found on another site nearby, they found remnants of ears of corn that the Indian had grown that were hundreds of years old that were still in existence because they were charred. And this is the way they learned like the diet and what, what did they survive on? You know, nobody, they didn't have a guidebook that said, well, if you're gonna have healthy foods, this is what you eat. They had to learn all that by experimentation and they became very knowledgeable. They even developed some of their own plants and this was determined from that research that they had, had developed special plants that were different than what was growing wild. But this pipe, and this was kind of an Indiana Jones moment. We go there with the backhoe, he digs down, pulls up one scoop full of dirt, and pieces of pottery started rolling out on the ground. And we, we picked them up, and they were glued back together, and this is a, a very large pottery shirt, as they call it. And then the archaeologist, Tom Charles with the Institute, naturally he was pretty excited. So he got down in the hole with the ice pick and just started probing the side of the hole. And he bumped into something hard. He couldn't see it, but he bumped into an object. So then he got out, you know, what archaeologists do. They get up little tiny tools and start carefully digging, and we're standing there watching, you know. This, this, I mean, it was, this was really a big deal. And he's getting in there, and, and finally we, we, we see the edge of this begin to show up, and he's got little brushes and all this kind of stuff. And so after watching him for a couple of hours, this is, this is what he found laying there. Not only was the pipe laying there, but there was a rock right there beside it made of the very same material, almost like the maker of that pipe had laid that down there. Uh, it was as though he were prepared to start on another object the next day. Maybe something interrupted him and he never got to do it. Um, and then it's been sitting there. They carbon dated this. There was enough charcoal inside that pipe to determine that it was, is about 1,500 years old. They also tried to determine what had, the Indians had been smoking, which would have been great information and they have not learned that much about that because there's so much plant matter that's in the area with it they can't really tell if they were smoking it or if it just just the presence of it has kind of kind of tainted the result um, okay next slide um, this is some other uh, pottery that was found in the same vicinity with this big piece that I just showed you here and some of these are the hammer stones that they would use as they would chip away the rock to make points. And most of this material, the pottery, the pipe, some of these stones, and a lot, a lot of these points are associated with an Indian village that existed there about 1,500 years ago. Okay, next slide. These are some of the tools that we found there, or axes, I should say. This would be a, this would be a, um, these are two axes, and they're called polished celts. Uh, this would also be a little, it, it has a little dimple in there, and, and the archaeologists really weren't positive what that was, but they thought maybe it was actually something that was used possibly for mixing the paints that they would put on their faces. The uh, axes or celts there were earlier than some of those that you see that have a groove around them that they used to attach to the stick. If you flip to the next uh, slide there, um, one way that they attach those without it being grooved, they would take a sapling and split it, slide that in there, let the sapling grow around it and get a big kind of a bulging area of wood which might take a year or two, and then cut it off, and they had 
their axe and a ready-made hickory handle. One thing that indicated, though, was that the people who would have been doing that were not nomadic peoples. They were staying in one place, and that's what this, this was a village of people who stayed there. They farmed there. They trapped and hunted animals, but they were pretty much staying put. Okay, next one. The, uh, as, as that uh, project progressed, um, there was, uh, we learned about another site. Now this site, this first site I mentioned is on North Saluda River. You know, the Saluda River, there are three branches that come together and they, they cover a lot of northern Greenville County and Pickens County. Um, the, um, there was another site on the South Saluda. And so uh, we went over and got involved with the owners of that property and they um, found a really just one of the most wonderful sites in South Carolina now for exploring for these Indians of the backcountry. And these uh, are called um, chunky stones, which they're a gaming stone. I don't know why they're called chunky stones because there's nothing chunky about them. They look like they were polished by a machine. And they could be 400 years old, they could even be older. I don't know if they've been successful in carbon dating them, but um, they are like a, a stone wheel and they are so carefully polished that you can hold them up to the light and you can see light coming through them. And the Indians played games with these. They would roll them across the ground and compete with one another to see who could either strike the closest with the bow and arrow or with an idle idle, and they would compete with one another. They even perhaps settle arguments that way to determine who, who was best. Uh, these are some of the best of those ever found in the state, and those were found on the surface over that site before the dig, but that was one of the reasons that the, the Institute really wanted to investigate that site. Flip on over there if you would. And uh, we were talking about gaming stones. Um, my understanding is that um, um, lacrosse was developed from a, the game uh, that more of the Indians in the northern part of, the, of what is now America um, uh, played that. And in this area, it was called stickball. And it didn't have anything to do with baseball, but stickball was played with sticks made this way, and they would have a uh, deer skin made ball and that, sometime you should just research it because there were a lot of different versions of it. Some of them, they, they had a competition to try to hit a target with it. Some of it was a little bit like soccer or football where it was a game to see who could get to one end of a big field. But a lot of the Indians, instead of going to war with each other, they would have stickball competitions to settle their dispute. So not only was it fun, but it served a good purpose. So uh, the other thing to impress upon you, I want to be sure you understand how far back Indians go and that we, when we think of Indians around here, the Cherokee were here but represent a very, very short period of time. And another thing we tend to, we tend to think of Indians and teepees. Well, the Plains Indians did have teepees. There may have been some of those used here, but they also, in this area, they had permanent settlements. They were not roving around following herds of buffalo like the Plains Indians did. They did not have horses uh, until much later. Horses are not native to North America. They were brought over by the Spaniards. Um, so this is what some of their towns may have looked like. Uh, fences to protect them against their enemies who before the Europeans came here were other Indians. Um, so all that's wood, and other than, the, um, other than the stone tools or pottery that might remain, all that's going to be gone, you know, over any period of time. So what you would hope is that if you find a really good site, you might be able to find where they dug down deep in the soil to place these posts, and then when the posts rotted and went away, other soil would have caved into those holes 
And so they can take the soil down, get it real smooth, and they can see a difference in color where every post went in the ground. Next slide, and I'll show you what I'm talking about. And when they find those, as they've located them here, they can learn about the outlines and the dimensions of these structures, whether the structures were 500 years ago or 5,000 years ago. And that is a tremendous area of research for them, is to, is to try to sort that out. There's so much more to be known We've only scratched the surface. Next slide there and you'll see some more. If you can see that, um, this is uh, a post hole that's been excavated and when they find those, they carefully take out every little bit, little bit of soil in those post holes. They separate any larger artifacts and the rest of them, they'll bag them up and then later they are perhaps cleaned through a a screen with water for even the tiniest artifacts. And the charcoal in those may be dated. This is an area where you see the discoloration, which is, identifies where to look. Those archeologists that I've been around are so good at what they're doing, they can tell from the pressure when they take a tool and push it into the ground, they can tell by how hard that ground is, whether they're into soil that was ever disturbed or new soil. It's amazing what they can tell from that. Okay. This again shows what may have been one of those wooden barricades surrounding a town like the earlier picture showed. Okay, go ahead. Now this was a real prize on this second site. These are the chunky stones, gaming stones. I think these were the, on, the only uh, stones like that maybe that have been found in South Carolina in a research site. I think that's true. All the others have been found on the surface. And these were found, carefully ex excavated. Somebody bumped into something hard in the ground and carefully cleaned out around it. And the way that one is resting on the other is exactly where they've been sitting for a long time. Like game was over, put the stones here, something happened and never came back all these hundreds of years until somebody went down there and found them laying there side by side. Kind of eerie. Okay. Um, the other thing that um, as they uh, began to do research up here that, that came out of all of that was the discovery that the, um, the upcountry is covered with Indian rock or art or petroglyphs. Now, this, this is unusual. This is not a, a petroglyph. I think they call this a pictogram because it is colored. They used pigments on it. Um, Looks like possibly cats or something like that that they drew there. The, the photographer used a little bit of um, a filter or something to kind of brighten up the colors. They're not quite that bright, but uh, nevertheless, if you look closely, you can see those outlines. Those are very rare. Only a few of those have been found in South Carolina, and they're kept very quiet locations because they could be easily damaged. But then if you take the next slide, petroglyphs, which are carvings into the rock, and they're more common. There are thousands of those out there that have been found just in the last 15 years. Um, over near Pickens, the Haygood Mill, there is a, uh, now an enclosed uh, rock face over there. There's a protective building there that you can visit, and the rock is covered with hundreds of them. Now the thing about these petroglyphs, we have no idea what they mean. We don't know how old they are because there isn't anything material there to date them by. Uh, we find similarities in different parts of the country. We don't even know why. All we can do is catalog them and enjoy them and specul speculate about what they might mean. Um, okay, let's see. A couple of quick, next, next, the uh, reason I want to show you this we're talk, we've talked so much about Indians. Um, 
And you're familiar with Cherokee. Cherokee are the Indians that we think of uh, close to home here. And the Cherokee did for um, quite a few hundred years dominate the area that we're in now. Their main um, towns, though, were over to the west, Pickens County and Oconee County, and then on into North Georgia and Tennessee. T uh, places in Pickens and Oconee like uh, Toxaway, Jocasse, uh, Tomasi, uh, Seneca, Tougaloo, those names came from the locations of some of those Cherokee towns. They were substantial towns and they had big farms around those towns. Um, but if you get into those areas, you're pretty likely to find some Cherokee artifacts. But over here, very, very unlikely that you'll find a Cherokee stone artifact. Not only because this was not their most heavily inhabited place by towns, but because we also, when you think about it, the Cherokee occupied about the same period of time right here, and all this other Indian material that we're finding had thousands of years to accumulate. So if you find some Cherokee material, you've got to be in just the right place, and compared to the quantity of other material, it's just not as much. Another thing, as soon as the Cherokee were exposed to um, European technology, they started using guns and made their knives and some of their, um, possibly some of their arrowheads out of metal. Um, that might be a good place for a question, and I, I'm not going to allow too many questions because I find that after I get past the first one or two, then I can't answer the others because you get to a level that I don't understand. Go ahead. Um, how, how, how did the um, tribal Indians find all of this? How did they fight? or No, find, find, find it all. Find yeah. maybe material. Maybe find a place, maybe find rocks to make their arrowheads out of. Or find, okay, well, the, the, it's, it, there might be two parts to that question. might be find the material for these points and find a place to settle. Yeah? Um, or did they use sharp, sharp things? Did they, I don't understand. What did, what did they, they use, use sharp things for? Sharp teeth. Shark teeth? Shark's teeth? Well, uh, I don't know that much about that. Shark's teeth had to be useful to them, and, and it's possible, I haven't seen this, but it's possible that shark's teeth that were found down at the coast may have been traded for other things for Indians back here. That would be a really special find if someone, and, and maybe it's happened, but I don't know about it, but that would really be unique to find a shark's tooth on an Indian site in the upcountry. That should be in a museum if we find that, okay? There was a picture of these same points that we looked at. Yeah, yeah that's right. And also uh, these cells. And we have the pipe buried in here somewhere. We'll find it too later. Um, yeah. How long did it take you to find this? Oh, uh, boy, this has been accumulating. We've been finding it for uh, 20 or 30 years. 20 or 30 years. Yeah. They're real. We're going to hand them out in a few minutes so you can check that out for yourself. How about that? Um, let, let, me, let, me, let me start go ahead and say just a couple other things and then it might be time to hand out some of the material. Um, I haven't talked much about the Cherokee, and sometime you, you should have the opportunity just to, to uh, study the Cherokee. But what happened to the Cherokee? They, they lived here. Where did they go? Next slide there. This was a boundary that was established in the back of South Carolina in the 1760s. The Cherokee were over here, 
and the non-Cherokee people, the settlers and whatnot, were supposed to stay on this side of the line. That line is the same line that separates Greenville County from Spartanburg County. It goes right pretty much through Greer. The big BMW plant is right alongside that line. And it was established, the British and the Cherokee had a lot of conflict then, and they reached a treaty and established that line. But the, the non-Indians over here, the colonists, mostly they were of British descent, but they were colonists. They kept pushing over that line and settling on the, across the Indian line, and it made a lot of those Cherokee really angry. Well, the Cherokee relied on trade with the British, and that was why I showed you how to picture of those real pretty deer there. And we're going to pass around a big deer skin in a minute. Oh, here, I found some more rocks over here. Look at there. There's our pipe and our other things for you to look at. Uh, but this, um, this deer skin, deer skins were like gold in those days. They didn't find any gold here in this part of America. So the Indians would kill deer, skin them, ship the hides, and Br Great Britain just couldn't get enough deer skins. And they would provide the Indians with gunpowder and guns, and they'd, they'd ship the hides. They, they went out of Charleston, mostly. Um, well, as we got close to the outbreak of the Revolutionary War, and you've studied about the Revolutionary War, um, the British and the people that were living back here were both trying to get the Cherokee on their side. And they were making promises about Yes, we'll be able to provide you with guns, and yes, we'll buy your deer skins. But meanwhile, they kept making these Indians more and more angry about crossing over on their side. Well, finally, enough of the Cherokee became so enraged with that, they attacked the people that had settled there, all up and down. Go, go back to that line if you would there. They attacked all up and down this line here. And it just so happened that they did that almost to the day, the same time that the British tried to take Charleston by sea. If y'all studied the battle where the cannonballs uh, stuck into the, yes. the logs and yeah. bounced off, what, that same battle was going on at the same time the Indians, that was the battle for Fort Sullivan, now we call it Fort Moultrie, the Indians were attacking back here. Well, as far as the people back here were concerned, that convinced them that the Indians were on the side of the British. The British lost the battle down there and sailed away and didn't come back for several years. So the people in the back, and by the way, some of you may have had ancestors that were killed in those days. Bryce had ancestors that perished in those attacks. And there's a monument to that attack on Wade Hampton Boulevard, a big stone monument, and it's called the Hampton Massacre. And there were a lot of others, and some of you folks may have had ancestors there. But th then the survivors attacked the Indians, and they wanted to make sure that the Indians would not be bothering them when they had to fight the British. Is it time to pass yeah, everything up? Okay. I, I could listen to you forever, but well, that 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 got me through the last part. Let's That's have time to pass these out for them. To... Up to you. Okay. Yeah, you bet. That's one of the nicest ones right there. Look at that go. Elk lived here back in the times of the Indians, and they've been brought back, and they live here again. Yeah. You know another. Can you believe that? <laughs>